After a two-year wait, our veterans and town officials once again march down Mass Ave to salute our men and women in uniform. Unlike Veterans Day 2020, this year's celebration was in person, and ACMI News was there. The Arlington Reservoir gets a $300-plus-thousand-dollar federal grant to help make improvements to the massive project already underway there. We'll tell you how this money will be put to use. What's going on with all the double poles throughout Arlington, some of which are quite dangerous looking? We'll have reaction from town leaders tonight. And November is Native American Heritage Month. We take a look back at a recent celebration of indigenous peoples. History that goes back centuries before George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. ACMI News starts right now. From McLennan Park to Spy Pond, from Poets Corner to the Mystic River, we have Arlington covered. We're your neighbors, a friend you can turn to, giving you stories that count from people who care. Dedicated, determined, dependable. This is ACMI News. For the first time in two years, Arlington's Veterans Day Parade was held in person on November 11th along Mass Ave. Hello, I'm Paul Whirling. And I'm Carla Dorado. Thanks for joining us. You may recall last year, due to the pandemic, the ceremony was broadcast by ACMI. But this year was different. Our news director, Jeff Barn, was there to cover this year's event, which salutes our men and women in uniform. A slow procession of veterans, volunteers, and dignitaries slowly marched from Adams Street and down along Mass Avenue to the Central Fire Station to pay tribute to all Americans who worked night and day to preserve our way of life. Jeff Chunglo, Arlington's Director of Veteran Services, was pleased with the overwhelming crowd at the fire station on November the 11th, and he says that this hallowed ground adjacent to the fire station will forever be preserved and even upgraded for all of us to remember and to say thank you to all our U.S. veterans. It's great to finally be back in person again for Veterans Day. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. We have a great day here. Um, it's been long overdue, and I do have some special announcements that I'll be making during the ceremony. Um, and so I'll give you a little preview now. At the select board meeting uh, this past Monday, the board approved that the land adjacent to the fire station here, all the way up to the Civil War Memorial, will be designated, is now designated as Arlington's Veterans Memorial Park. So we'll begin preparations and plans to contact uh, someone for renderings and, and we'll be able to put that together and uh, review it with the Veterans Council and then begin our series of open meetings. For those servicemen and women who are with us today, either here in person or watching at home through ACMI, I want to thank you for your service to the United States. It is that service that provides us with our freedoms today. First of all, the select board made a very important decision regarding the ground we're standing on right now. Yeah, it, Monday night, Jeff Chunglow came before us with the Veterans Council with a request to rename this Arlington's Veteran Memorial Park. And we were happy to do it. This is, in our view, the appropriate place to have a memorial to our veterans and to honor our veterans through the honor roll. And as you can see here today, it, the, the property, the honor roll was created in 1999. The area is in need of upgrades, and, and it really needs to be a more appropriate, um, some, some work to make it a more appropriate setting to honor our veterans. We're happy to support that. I feel like we should be thinking about our veterans and being thankful for our veterans and caring for our veterans every day. But this is a day once a year, along with Memorial Day, where we can really individually and especially thank our veterans for their service. And, and I, I hope today, specifically, is a jumping off point for honoring them even more wholly via a development of this park that's right behind us right now into an even more dedicated and improved Veterans Memorial Park. I served in Iraq in 2009, 2010. I'm currently serving in the Mass National Guard. I'm on orders uh, providing COVID support for the uh, existing missions that involves COVID support. Among a very unusual battle we've been fighting now for almost two years. What does Veterans Day mean to you? Uh, a lot, there are a lot of sales out there, a lot of people selling discount mattresses and, and cars and things like that. Veterans Day means a heck of a lot more than that, especially to someone like yourself who's dedicated to the military. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, I don't really follow all that free stuff. Um, I, I, it's good to be able to celebrate Veterans Day again 
We haven't been able to do it for a couple of years. Um, what it means to me, it means a, an opportunity to um, uh, be thankful for the sacrifices and the ultimate sacrifices that um, soldiers, sailors and Marines have uh, made throughout the years. This holiday was originally known as Armistice Day, a holiday set aside right after World War I to recognize those who fought in the so-called Great War, the war to end all wars. This according to the U.S. Department of Veterans Services. Its origin dates back to the Armistice, a temporary end to all hostilities between the Allied nations and Germany. And the Armistice was signed in France on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. Now, just a few decades later, in 1954, just one year after the Korean War and less than a decade after World War II, it became known as Veterans Day. This came about as a result of several service organizations, veterans service organizations, approached Congress and urged them to encompass and include all U.S. veterans involved in wars. An Arlington tradition once again taking place in person on a beautiful fall day. A time to forget our own problems we have in our own daily lives and give thanks to a very special kind of American who exhibits a never-ending burden and who has a love for country unlike any other. For ACMI News, I'm Jeff Barnd. We told you in mid-October that the select board unanimously approved the Mass Ave Appleton Street intersection redesign to make that unusually configured intersection safer for motorists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. The plan was a compromise of sorts, initially sparked by the bicycling community. It includes incorporating safety measures which would create more visibility for eastbound cyclists pedaling down Mass Ave and westbound motorists making a left-hand turn on the Appleton Street. Our communications manager, James Milan, spoke to town manager Adam Chapdelaine last week, and ever since the town received the select board's blessing, things at Mass Ave and Appleton Place changed very quickly. So the compromise bike striping plan that the select board approved um, just I think two weeks ago now has been fully striped on the ground. Um, there are a couple additional things that will happen as months go on that take a longer lead time to plan and install, but the main striping and I believe the bollards are on the ground. Uh, what you'll experience if you're driving eastbound is you will see a striped bike lane on Mass Ave through the intersection with Mass Ave, Appleton Place, and Appleton Street. If you're driving westbound, you'll see that through the majority of that intersection, there's what's called a shared lane with sharrows, arrows that delineate that you're sharing the road with a bicycle, that then continue up to a bike lane, continuing westbound into the heights. Really, uh, oh, and additionally, I would say there is um, a striped curb extension coming out from the triangle where Appleton Street and Appleton Place uh, uh, meet to be able to better control vehicle movements. And then finally, in the middle of the road on Mass Ave, there are bollards in place that make the left turn from Mass Ave onto Appleton Street more of a sharp turn as opposed to bearing left as what that was the, the condition before these improvements were put in place. So I think the main thing I would say is our goal here is to increase safety and to try to get motorists and all users to utilize that area as safely as possible. So I would encourage motorists to drive very carefully through that area, acclimate themselves to the new striping. Uh, you'll have to go through a little slower than you went through before. And that's the goal, uh, to be able to create a safe environment for all users. Um, so there are plans available online that folks can look at. 
some great photographs that Joan Roman, the town's public information officer, took yesterday with her drone capturing an aerial view that really gives you a good sense of the layout of what's been put in place. Um, so I, I think in summation, I would say, you know, really encourage people as they're driving through there, go slowly, acclimate yourself to the changes and help us meet our goals of enhancing safety. You may recall Charles Proctor was cycling through the intersection when he was struck and killed by a motorist in May 2020. A memorial bicycle in his honor still sits at the crossroads. The town of Arlington has just secured a $307,000 federal grant to help restore the Arlington Reservoir. The Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund grant helps Arlington's commitment to put improvements into motion, which were recommended by the so-called Reservoir Master Plan, financed through capital funds and the Community Preservation Act. This, according to a recent town news release, Town leaders say the grant will be spent on additional improvements to the park, the perimeter trail, invasive plant removal, and upgrading the boat launch in nearby pathways. The money will also pay for water erosion prevention measures. To find out more about the project, you can go to the town website, arlingtonma.gov. As we enter the holiday season, the Red Cross is asking people to give the gift of blood this time of the year. The Red Cross staged a blood donation drive at St. Athanasius Greek Orthodox Church on Appleton Street earlier this week. The current blood supply is the lowest the Red Cross has, has reported this time of year in more than a decade. And one Red Cross official told us at least 10,000 donations are needed every week for the next month or so to at least meet the demand. There is an incentive this go around. People donating blood through, through, through Tuesday, November 23rd will receive a $10 Amazon gift card courtesy of Amazon.com. The Arlington Knights of Columbus at 15 Winslow Street is set to hold a Red Cross blood drive from 2 to 7 p.m. November 15th. You can go to the Red Cross website for more information at redcross.org. The town of Arlington provided more than 1,200 COVID-19 vaccine shots for children 5 to 11 years old as of Saturday, November 6th, according to town leaders. This took place at Arlington High School's Red Gym just days after the director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention gave the go-ahead for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. As soon as that link was shared with the school department, uh, which, which they then shared, those 1,200 appointments were taken, taken up. We expect that we might be able to get an additional 900 doses, which would enable us to offer additional vaccine clinics probably sometime mid next week. And my understanding of the whole idea is there are plenty of doses to go around to make this work. And getting them to local government was to take the pressure off the pharmacies and the primary care physicians so that between those three main sources, hopefully we'll be able to get all the kids in that age range vaccinated that want to be vaccinated. So we're excited about this, uh, continue to be very lucky to have Christine Bongiorno and Natasha Waden at the helm over in our public health shop, uh, putting this together very quickly and running it efficiently and effectively. So um, I think it, it's an exciting time. It's a scary time, but it's an exciting time to get this pretty significant population vaccinated. And hopefully then a few weeks out or months, maybe a month and a half out, start to see reductions in the trends of transmission based on this population starting to become vaccinated. According to a press release sent this week, approximately 75 volunteers from Arlington Health Human Services, public schools, town offices, and the Medical Reserve Corps staff the clinic. School leaders encourage any parent or guardian who has not yet vaccinated their child to do so as soon as they are able. An absolute disgrace. That's what Arlington Select Board Chair called a problem that doesn't seem to be dwindling in town. On the contrary, it seems to be rampant. ACMI's news director, Jeff Barn, reports double utility poles have become a highly charged issue among residents and town leaders alike. Just take a short drive through Arlington and sooner or later, you're going to come across one of these sites. An old utility pole paired with a new one. According to town leaders, there are nearly 150 such sites. And according to Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy in late October, they have become a town eyesore and certainly a nuisance. Back in November of 2020, um, it was either Eversource or Verizon that was in, I believe it was Eversource on that night. Um, I raised the question about double poles and, and one in particular that, that had troubled me was across, one of, was on Mass Ave across the street from Elmhurst Street because we had approved a certain type of, um, we had approved something called a hip guy 
a double pole was installed and the double pole is still there. It was there on November 9th. It was there presently. According to State General Laws Chapter 164, Section 34B, it says in part, a distribution company or a telephone company engaging in the removal of an existing pole and the installation of a new pole in place thereof shall complete the transfer of wires, all repairs, and the removal of the existing pole from the site within 90 days from the date of installation of the new pole. But there doesn't seem to be any retribution if the utility companies don't comply with the statute. There's no fine, there's no sanction or anything like that. We have talked to our, our legislative delegation. I know Mr. Chaplin has had discussions within MMA, and it's the type of thing where I really think going forward, there needs to be some annual progress towards the goal of, of, of uh, removing double poles. The concept of double polling is relatively simple, really. When you have an old pole that has outlived its usefulness, like this one at Adams and Mass Ave, a new pole is brought in and hitched to the old pole so that the new pole props the old pole up. That's supposed to be temporary. Now, eventually, the old pole is supposed to be removed and the new pole takes the old pole's place. But clearly, throughout many places in this town of Arlington, the double polling has stuck around and outlived its usefulness, and it certainly has outlived its welcome. I would be interested in finding out what our legislators could do about it because I mean, as you say, as you, you pointed out, I mean, there is no teeth I mean, uh, in the legislation. I mean, and I mean, these things don't happen by accident. I mean, I'm sure it happened a while ago, but it might be that there is a uh, appetite for doing something more. Uh, I mean, my concern about I me mean, not granting I me mean, what they're asking for is that we may be cutting off our nose and spite our face. I mean, if indeed what they want to do is something that's going to benefit I me mean, and our residents, I me, mean, we don't want to stop them from doing that. We contacted Verizon and Eversource for a comment, and we heard back from Verizon via email. Verizon is currently up to date for all its double pole work in Arlington. The process requires work across several companies, including power and cable TV. All of the current double poles in Arlington are awaiting work from another party. Once the work comes to Verizon, we will complete our work in a timely manner. A spokesman for Eversource says the company is looking into the problem. If you've driven, biked, or walked past the Jason Russell house lately, you may be wondering what the fences are all about in front of Mr. Russell's front yard. Crews are digging wells for a geothermal heating and cooling system for the property. The $250,000 project is funded by the Community Preservation Act and will help improve climate inside the historic home. The house is currently not heated nor cooled and this will help protect the material of the house itself, as well as the objects within. It'll also make it more comfortable for tourists visiting over the summer and winter months. Three to five wells will be installed in the drilling area to a depth of up to 300 feet. There will be no above ground structures. Arlington Historical Society officials have told us this project is set to be complete by early 2022. If you ordered a Sunday on Tuesday, November 9th from Abbott's Frozen Custard at Arlington Center, not only did you get a sweet treat, you were also benefiting our students. Abbott's donated 20% of all proceeds that day to the Dallin Elementary School. So you got your fresh ice cream and helped that school at the same time. You'll recall just a few weeks ago, 20% of all proceeds at Abbott's Arlington Center location went to the Gibbs School. The general manager of Abbott's, Mark Richards, told ACMI News recently that this will be an ongoing tradition at Abbott's for other area schools as well. This offer only applied to the Abbott's on Broadway Plaza, not the Abbott's on Park Avenue in the Heights. November is National Native American Heritage Month. It raises awareness about Native American history and present day struggles to be faced. It also expresses hope for the future. You're looking at the Indigenous Peoples Day celebration last month in Newton, the largest celebration of its kind in this area. Many Arlington volunteers took part. Organizers of this event say it's vital that all of us remember that. Native American history dates back centuries before Christopher Columbus was even born. Here now to celebrate National Native American Heritage Month, we take a look back at Indigenous Peoples Day, which took place in October. My connection to it is that I am indigenous from the Western Hemisphere. Why is it so important to expunge Columbus Day and 
pronounce Indigenous Peoples Day. What I learned in, in our, my history class was that Columbus discovered America and that was it. Exactly. Well, the reality is that we, the Taino people, were the ones who discovered Columbus. And we end up being just a footnote in history. And that is um, one of the reasons why it's important for us to put ourselves in the forefront and tell the real story. Uh, the story is told by the victor. It is his story, after all, you know. But the victims uh, of, of, uh, of this, uh, what we call the Holocaust, you know, um, are unknown. Most people don't know who the Taino were uh, back then, who the Taino are today. We were uh, declared extinct, um, and the reason for the extinction comes from many different avenues. It's not one thing that, that uh, brought us to this extinction um, narrative. But, uh, but we were declared extinct, and it wasn't until the late 90s when, um, you know, DNA studies and things of that nature, uh, severe, intense uh, research uh, brought us back to the forefront. Because of public education, because of how our students are actually um, uh, treated within classrooms, our, our students are going to classrooms, they're uh, standing up for the stories and the knowledge that they've learned in homes. They're hearing about these stories about Columbus. They're hearing the stories about the land that they're on. And they're actually standing up and saying, no, this is not what I was taught by my grandmother. This is not what I was taught by my mom. And sometimes they're often disciplined for that. And so in making this change uh, from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, we're actually affirming knowledge that's taught in the homes and being st uh, stand up, stand, stood up for by our students and by our elders as well. I think Americans, uh, especially uh, white America, considers history to be Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and everything else. Your history goes back thousands of years. Yes, uh, and, and I, am, uh, I am a guest on these lands. I am from the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. Um, our, our, our figures, our, our landscape is completely different from uh, where we are right now on the homelands of the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, the Wampanoag. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have a very shared history of, of cultivating all of the lands that have been here uh, since time immemorial. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at this story of 500, 200 years standing up against millennia and you're actually seeing the people that have been here for all this time, that story is starting to come forward once and more. We all learned that, didn't we? We all learned this uh, BS. We, we learned lies, unfortunately, and uh, we have to ask ourselves a question like, who is writing these textbooks? Who is promoting this sort of propaganda? And the answer is white supremacy. I know it's a hard, it's, some, it's hard to hear, but that, that is the truth of it. And my emotional connection is that I want to end that. I want to decolonize. I want to end white supremacy. Um, I'm an advocate and an ally, and I firmly believe that returning the land back to original land owners, uh, to original land stewards, um, and working towards healing as justice and justice as healing, um, that's my emotional tie. And it, it starts with letting uh, indigenous people lead, even indigenous black and people of color leading. So that's my emotional tie. I'm here as an ally. I'm here to stand behind, support, uplift, respect, honor. Since we're the indigenous people, sometimes it's come out to make ourselves seen and let people know we still exist. Many times people think we're in the history books, but we don't live in the present day, but we do. We have an interesting, a long history. One thing you have to understand is that um, Native American, indigenous people's history uh, is start, started here first and everything else. You can't have American history without indigenous peoples. Um, and, that, and that is a fact. So for people to know and not be listening to the sanitized truths um, or what they deem as truths, the sanitized history of America they need to look at the true history and see the role that they played in that. And then they'll see that the Native people have been here and continue to be here. And we, uh, you know, we're the Narragansett, but there's many tribes across this country um, where this, you know, where we, we, we live and, and have communities and have our own forms of government and exist and, and flourish today, you know.
Officials of this Newton event say they hope to have even more Arlingtonians join in this effort next year. In tonight's sports segment, it was National Signing Day this week at Arlington High School. Athletes looking to take it to the next level. Field production coordinator Anim Osmani was there. The Arlington High School Athletics Department has seen a very successful start to the season across multiple sports, as all varsity teams has a combined win percentage of around over 80%, with four out of the five teams making it to the state tournament. This is probably the best start any high school can ask for. Today, November 10th, six student athletes representative of the athletics program and who contributed to its success signed their intent to take their skills to the next level. Today is a, is a great day for these student athletes, um, you know, as, as they continue to, to move on to the next level and uh, continue, you know, being a student athlete at the college level. National Signing Day is a day in which student athletes who received verbal offers from collegiate athletic programs signed the national letter of intent to participate in sports at the college level. Only a small percentage of high school athletes move on to the next level. Arlington High School set up a special photo booth for athletes and their families to celebrate the occasion. Um, it's really exciting for me because it's been a goal of mine really long to play soccer at the next level and I'm just really excited to be able to keep playing and keep improving. Wittrick gets out there. That was well, well, well played. First ball and second ball won by the... I'm just really excited to start this new chapter and I'm really looking forward to meeting all of my new teammates and my coach. Uh, I'm extremely excited. It's something I've worked very hard for and I devoted a lot of time and effort every day towards it and having it actually pay off and um, be able to move on and look forward to the future is really nice. A message to your teammates, coaches, family, or anyone that you'd like to share? Uh, just thank you for supporting me and thank you for believing in me. I couldn't have done it without all of them. So. It kind of doesn't feel real, but it's super exciting at the same time, especially seeing all of my um, up and coming teammates committing and signing as well. So it's re just really exciting. I'd like to thank my parents first, uh, driving me to hockey and baseball since I was like five. Dad used to tie my skates. He was my baseball coach growing up, so he's always been a huge part in my baseball career. And my mom is my rock and my supporting unit. Um, and all my teammates who have always pushed me and coaches who have led me in the right direction to get me to where I am today. I mean, I think the stats that only like two or three percent of high school athletes even play at the college level. So, um, you know, these these student athletes who are playing at the Division three, II, Division two II, and Division one level. Um, you know, they're 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 the elite of lead of the, um, you know, the student athletes in the United States, in the country, um, you know, because not many people go on to play college athletics. And it's just great to see that, you know, we have you know, so many uh, so many students uh, moving on uh, to the next level. Reporting from Arlington High School for ACMI News, I'm Anil Osmani. Now sending it to Studio B, also here at the high school, for this week's Ponderscope. Greetings and welcome back to this week's Ponderscope. I'm here to give you the scoop on what's happening this week at AHS. Firstly, I would like to remind our students and staff that COVID testing is available outside the main offices and the cafeteria. Tryouts for winter sports are open starting November 29th, the Monday after Thanksgiving. Click the link below to register or check the athletics website. Need help with schoolwork? Have you been looking for a tutor? The National Honor Society has tutors available to help every day in the media center. That's it for this week's Ponder Scope. I'm Ana Severa and I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. That'll do it for this week's newscast. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Paul Whirling. And I'm Carla Dorado. We'll leave you tonight with a bit of Hollywood in our backyard. A crew reportedly from the Lifetime Channel was filming a scene in front of the Region Theater in Arlington Center recently. According to one crew member, filmmakers were shooting a scene from a movie tentatively titled Malicious Minds. And you may see this crew out and about in your neighborhood in the near future. If you do, remember, quiet on the set. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe. You can always check out our latest segments and newscasts on the web at acmi.tv news. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at ACMI News. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. 
you'll find us at youtube.com slash ACMI news. If you have any news tips for us or wish to become a citizen journalist, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at news at acmi.tv or stop by ACMI Studio A at 85 Park Avenue.